they um, it's something that's happening um, nationally um, with all, with this pandemic um, and what we're up against, right? So um, I'll start with this. This is uh, my show's title, Prieto, um, and it goes like this. I've told this story hundreds of times, so much that I've learned, reached a point in which I add more details to spice it up. I don't know where you've been for the last 10 years, but immigration is a hot topic. It's in, it is trendy. Being a citizen is so overrated. If you want free press, you should bring your social and be a rebel like me, live your life as undocumented. I have no memory of my crossing, but for the sake of this show, I will entertain you with something more dramatic. Cause really who's gonna check public records? You can't, we're undocumented. It's an August night in 1991. My abuela is the mastermind behind this whole plan. My abuelo, like always, is drunk. My mother crossed two years prior, so she finally saved enough money to send for us. She hired a coyote. For those of you who are culturally impaired, I don't mean a coyote. I mean a human smuggler to get us across. When I say human smuggler, I'm sure you're imagining a character out of narco or some badass drug cartel leader, but our smuggler was a senora. Straight up, this lady looked like she could be selling tamales on the corner of 24th and Mission. Don't judge a book by its cover because that sweet old lady selling you those delicious tamales could be a drug smuggler. It is pitch dark and all you hear is the sound of grasshoppers all around us. The sky is lit up by the stars. We're a group of 13, mostly men, except my abuela and my brother and me. Before crossing, my abuelo had a going away a party of sorts, so he's crossing the border hungover. I know what you're thinking, how responsible. But when you think about it, when well, you're about to leave your country, your land, your whole life behind just to come a place that you know nothing about, what else is there to do than drink up? Lord knows if I'm about to cross the desert like some fear factor challenge, I'm gonna need a couple of shots. Excuse me, senora, please give me a couple of seconds. I take a chalk from the bottle. Okay, let's go, vamonos. Once we cross the desert, it's when things got interesting. Being that I'm three years old, my abuela's main concern is me crying and giving away this whole operation. They have to stick the four of us under the backseat of a car, some human Tetris type thing. These adults think that the best preventative measure to avoid me making any noise is to give me NyQuil. So that's the basic plot of my migration story. I was drugged, kidnapped, and brought here. I didn't even want to come. You would think that there would be enough dramatic details to convince conservatives of my humanity, but they just need a little more. They always need a little more. Cue in the Sarah McCollin animal cruelty commercial. This is Yosimar Reyes. He is a DACA beneficiary. Yosimar is a dreamer. When he crossed the desert, uh, the border at three years old, he did not know he was breaking the law. He thought he was coming to Disneyland. Call your Congress people now and save Yosimar's life. Truth be told, I feel that if truth be told, I feel if I was a dog getting deported, conservatives would be outraged. I can see the headlines now. All dogs go to heaven, free them all, cages are cruel. If there were masses of dogs being deported on the daily, immigration de de detention centers would be abolished by now. When people ask me, what was it like? Did you have to write La Bestia to get here with the drug cartels right behind you? Please tell us about the silence. My scholarship response is always, it was a dark, gloomy morning, typical in a Mexican morning because we're such a developing country that the sun doesn't shine. My abuela heard a whisper in the wind and it was La Virgen de Guadalupe. My daughter, you are to migrate north. This child of yours is the Messiah, like Buffy, the vampire slayer. He is the chosen one. It would be best if you took him to the United States. This child is on a mission to denounce imperialism and eradicate white supremacy. Only he can stop this, so pack your things and go. So at the age of three years old, I packed my belongings in cardboard boxes tied by shoestrings, and I began my pilgrimage. Um, so I tell this story simply because I feel like sometimes, you know, when you are an immigrant, <laughs> people are constantly asking you like, oh my God, how did you get here? And then when you tell them you're undocumented, people want you to tell them this like tragic migration story that I don't remember because legit they gave me like, well, and I woke up here, I was like, oh my God, this is not Mexico anymore. Um, and so that's kind of like the narrative um, that I, I'm kind of toying with. I use a lot of humor in my writing simply because I, I like to make fun of uh, my, my situation because it's the way that I kind of cope with being undocumented and stuff. Um, this next video I'm going to show, um, I just produced it 
Um, and I was, one of the things that, that I decided to come back to San Jose was simply because I felt like I was in LA doing my thing, but then I was like, I still need to come help my family. Um, and my grandma lives in this neighborhood that it's predominantly undocumented folks that live here, but I was interested in kind of seeing the way that undocumented communities are kind of supporting each other is due to COVID. I'm in California and California, I think we, Governor Newsom, um, announced that they were going to give uh, aid of $500 to all uh, undocumented people. And sadly, it wasn't really easy to funnel that money. But what well, we all know that $500 for like three months, it's not sufficient, right? And a lot of our parents are essential workers because they are working uh, at, at the, they're, they're store clerks, they're working um, in janitorial services, they're working at hospitals, they're working in these places that are, you know, essential workers. So, one of the things that I started noticing is how my grandmother's comadre started kind of um, checking it on each other. And so I wrote this piece um, and I, um, and one of the things that I wanted to do is also how do you, I utilize my platform and my voice to kind of bring aid and attention to what's happening in my community. Um, and thanks to this video and kind of and vocalizing the needs of my community, we were able to raise $7,000 in two days and we partnered with a local nonprofit organization that matched that. So we were able to hit aid about 23 undocumented families um, through one poem. So I think for me, like when I talk about poetry and how I use my poetry to kind of have an impact in my community, like that's all that kind of, if I did not write that piece, right, I, I don't think we would have been able to access um, the, the funds that we did get. So I'm really grateful that we were able to that. So I'll show you this video and then I'll get into my presentation and then we'll do a, a Q and A. Okay. Let me see, it's kind of loud. Seeing Abuela's distraction has been spent in our living Mi Abuela is 85 years old. And since we began social distancing, Abuela's distraction has been spent in our living room watching telenovelas y las noticias. I spent my day stuck in my room, pressured by writing deadlines and Zoom calls. I try to break down to her how I can still work through the computer and what a Zoom call is, but it goes over her head. So she leaves me alone for a couple of hours until she comes barging in the room, reminding me, no has comido en todo el día. We sit down to eat, and through conversation, she explained to me the latest updates with COVID-19. Abuela doesn't understand that through social media, I'm already aware of these updates. Univision gives her tips on how to disinfect the house, precautions she should warn us about when running essential errands. She knows that she's high risk, being that she's 85, so she's very attentive to what the news informs her. Trump announced a stimulus check of $1,200 given to every American. Excitedly, she asked, ¿Y nosotros nos van a dar? I have to explain to her that undocumented people who file taxes with an ITIN number do not qualify. She shows concern for her comadres because she knows they aren't as lucky as her. She knows she has me, and with my English, I've been essential in helping navigate resources for her. She also heard that Governor Newsom in California announced an eviction moratorium. He gets eviction. I explained to her that this means landlords cannot evict people for not being able to pay the rent. But it does not make sense because even if you're not able to pay, your rent will accumulate and you will need to pay back rent. Many undocumented people who live paycheck to paycheck, this will create a system in which they will be indebted to landlords. No es justo. Si nosotros trabajamos, Abuela is aware that during this pandemic, undocumented labor is the backbone that is holding America together. These essential workers are the same ones we've seen go viral for being asked to speak English while providing customer service. These are the workers so many opposed to making a living wage with the excuse, if they wanted to make more money, they should have gone to school. As if education did not equal student loans and was a guarantee of making a living wage in this country. These are also the farm workers we essentialize when wanting to prove that brown hands picked your salad. Abuelas comadres are like her, non-traditional workers. They are street vendors, recycle bottles and cans, work cleaning hotel rooms, nannies, or go door to door selling Mary Kay products. She calls them, and when they have questions, she hands me the phone so I can explain to them the resources provided locally. The señoras are grateful for my intelligence, and before hanging up, say, Gracias a Dios que te llamé. Thank God I called you. In this same regard, Abuela has placed the uncertainty of this moment in prayer. She sits with the giant print Bible in her lap, and with her magnifying glass, she reads scriptures. 
during this quarantine, she has vowed to read the Bible cover to cover. She says her faith is the sole reason she has been able to survive this country. And I believe her. It takes a divine power, unearthly energy to be undocumented in America. While the rhetoric in this country is that we are the invisible enemy, Abuela and her comadres built networks of support for one another. Through phone calls, texts, and WhatsApp messages, they check in on each other. While the Trump administration weaponizes these moments to vilify us, we prepare for the next battle that lies ahead. The invisible enemy, a group of señoras praying for the fate of the undocumented. Um, and yeah, so this is the poem that, um, let me shut this down, Lord Jesus. So yeah, this is kind of like a, a new piece that I'm kind of developing. And I'm really grateful for these women that are part of my grandma's life, simply because siento que a veces, when we think, one of the things that I wanted to express when like the developing work or, or, or doing everything um, was the fact that muchas veces when we think of our lives and our communities, we think that we're powerless, right? I think I often taught that. When I was growing up, I grew up in the hood, grew up working class. My grandma recycled bottles and cans. I grew up in a crammed up apartment, two bedroom apartment. Um, and growing up, I constantly felt frustration because you know, your parents do things that I'm like, oh my God, they're such immigrants. Why are they such immigrants? Um, but I started learning about cultural wealth, right? And one of the things that I learned about cultural wealth was that even though I did not have access to different things and I came from a marginalized community and I didn't have a lot of things that I wanted to have, right? When I was 16, I would see all my friends that would get driver's, driver's permits um, and they would be allowed to drive. That's something that as an undocumented immigrant, I did couldn't do because, you know, they didn't give driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. So I thought, I grew up believing that my heart was, my life was really hard and complicated with all these struggles and all these things. But I think for me, one of the interesting things that I started to do as I was writing and developing my poetry was that I started noticing that I had really unique experiences that nobody else could write about and that nobody can uh, other, other than me could access. Um, I, end, I went to San Francisco State University and I wanted to major in English. Everybody told me that I should major in something else. But I, for me, I like books. I was a nerd. Um, so I, I'm still a nerd. I really like books. And so I found myself reading a lot. And I said, I want to become an English major because if I become an English major, that means that I can learn how to write um, the stories of where I come from and I can learn how to um, develop and have people kind of know that we actually exist. And I think for me, growing up, I never really read any literature that had to do with like being poor, being an being a queer, being an undocumented immigrant. And so I wanted to develop different stories around that. Um, and it was cool because I would submit them and people didn't even know what to do with them because they're like, oh my God, people live like this. I'm like, yes, people recycle bottles and cans to make a living. Like that's the life that we exist in. Um, and so I think that's what kind of gave me a unique perspective of everything that I, that I, that voice that I wanted to use. These are my grandparents, that's my abuelita and my abuelito, they're the ones that brought me to the United States um, when I was three years old. So I have no memory of Mexico. So when people, you know, a lot of, I don't know if you're Mexican, but we, you know, when you come from your home country, you're out here repping it, right? You're like, I'm Mexican. I'm like tacos de rochata all the time, all day, every day. But you know, that's as far as it goes because I don't remember, I haven't really been, I went back on advanced parole, but other than that, I haven't really um, been back. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of kind of my background and then we can open it up to a conversation. So I was born in 1988, you do the math how old I am. <laughs> and I was born in the state of Guerrero, Mexico, which is Southern Mexico, which is really, really down there. Um, and growing up, I grew up in an immigrant household. My abuelita, back in the day, we had VHS tapes. So she would play all these VHS tapes that my Teo Rene used to send him, for, send her from Mexico. And she would always be like, oh my God, that's your house. That's where you come from. And I was a bratty American kid because, you know, I grew up in the United States. So I would be like, oh girl, like, I don't see my, you know, I don't know if you ever heard Los Tigres del Norte, La Jaula de Oro. But there's that interlude where the kid is like, I don't want to go to Mexico, dad. That was me <laughs> when thinking of like going back to Mexico. Cause like, oh my God, 
And I, I was like, so I remember like I was so gay because during that time that Destiny's Child album came out, the, the Survivor one. And in my head, I was like, oh my God, if we get deported, I am not gonna know when Destiny's Child drops another album. Like that's gonna be so sad. <laughs> that was my main concern about getting deported, that I was not gonna know when Destiny's Child was gonna drop another album. Um, and so um, this kind of picture was like how I grew up. Um, my two younger um, sisters were born in the United States. My sister, my, my sister Marlene, which is the second oldest right here, she was born in San Diego. My mom had tried crossing like she was she caught she was caught seven times and on the seventh time um, she managed to get through and my sister barely made it. It was born in San Diego and then my younger sister was born in San Jose and it means me and my older brother were the only ones that were un are undocumented in our immediate family of course including my my parents. So there's like a junior, new generation uh, of of immigrants. I, we, uh, 1991, we crossed. I had a very much um, American upbringing. It's very interesting because Netflix just, uh, I mean, some of you are really young, but Netflix um, just announced that they acquired like uh, a bunch of shows that I grew up on, uh, which I'm excited about. Um, but I grew up on, I, I, when I was growing up, kind of like there was a lot of um, TV that was um, created by Black creators. And so I grew up on that, Moesha, the Waynes Brothers, all these shows that kind of, uh, that I thought was American culture, right? And so my upbringing in Eastside San Jose was very much like that. My older cousins already spoke English. So by the time I entered elementary school, I had a good grasp on the language. I knew how to navigate el inglés and similar like some of you right cuando están vas a la escuela you translate all the time i was a translator for my grandparents which was so frustrating because i felt like i couldn't have a childhood because it would be like ven para acá ven para acá and i would have to translate everything um so i was a little inglés in barreras um and so one of the things that was very interesting about jobs for undocumented immigrants or immigrants in general, right? I think for a lot of our families, it's very hard to establish themselves in this country simply because people don't give us adequate wages or work that's dignified, right? Right now, it's very interesting because I've been seeing like this meme that's going around the internet about like, if you're not able to save based on your the unemployment that a lot of people kind of um that the unemployment that a lot of people get i think right now one of the things that people are doing is like shaming people for not being able to save but i think it's very important for us to recognize that we are living amidst a pandemic we are living in a moment in history that we have never experienced before and it's very interesting for me the way that in this country we kind of shame poor people for the decisions that they make and as someone that grew up in a working class kind of poor um, household I think for me, it's very important for us to know that and net, I, when I was growing up, I thought being poor was basically my fault. It was like an, a, a decision that my grandparents made or something bad that they just didn't know how to manage money. But it wasn't that. It was that they were immigrants. Nobody would pay them a living wage. People are out here, you know, when we when people are fighting for 15 or getting workers to make a living wage, it means that we want workers to be able to afford the rent, be able to afford buying anything that they want right and i think i think in this country we've been conditioned to shame make it a people problem as opposed to view it as a structural thing because you know why is jeff bezos becoming a, a trillionaire while the average american is struggling to kind of pay the rent and i think that's what i try to tie in to the first po the poem that i did about like undocumented communities is that there's this idea that undocumented immigrants take so much from this country, but the reality is that we are the backbone, our labor is the backbone that keeps this country together, right? If it wasn't for the farm workers that are still working, if it wasn't for our mamas or papas that are working in the stores, if it wasn't for uh, our, our, our tios that are custodians, construction workers, these industries that are very much needed of human labor, I think we wouldn't be here, especially in this pandemic. Um, and so I think for me, that was one of the important things to recognize that though people view us as expendable, it's muy importante for our communities to kind of know that no, we matter and because we give so much, it's important that we advocate to be treated equally and that we advocate to be treated just like any other person in this country. Um, 
one of the things I tell people are undocumented, I'm undocumented. They always tell me if I'm afraid, right? Like, aren't you scared they're coming after you? Especially right now, Netflix released, uh, uh, Netflix just released a documentary called Immigration Nation or, or something that just came out. I haven't watched it because I'm not trying to ruin my week, um, but I'll probably watch it uh, uh, sometime on Sunday or something. But I know that there's a lot of terror that happens to our communities in, regarding um, uh, what's happening um, in policy wise, pero para mí lo que se me hace más importante is like how our communities are taking care of each other and what are we doing to make sure that we stay safe and what are we doing to make sure that we are, um, you know, taking care of my mental health. So that's why partially when I do tell my stories or when I write, I don't really talk about my fears or anxieties because I don't want to continue contributing to that kind of well of stories that already exist. So that's why I use a lot of humor in the work that I do because I want to make fun of it. I want to be able to laugh. I want people to laugh with me. I want people to be like, oh my God, I can't believe he said that um, because I also want to, that is very important to me. Um, let me see. So yeah, I think when I was growing up, this was this was California's not worst nightmare. This was like the United States worst nightmare. It was little brown kids that went to school, um, that spoke English, that kind of learned how to manage um, things. I was always into books. So I always felt like I was smart. So I think that's kind of like helped me aid my schooling until I discovered poetry. I discovered poetry when I was in a junior in high school, one of my teachers was like, oh, I see you're writing all the time. You're writing in a, um, a little notebook. I had a notebook, but I wasn't really writing poems. I was writing about the people that annoyed me in high school. So, you know, you, it was like a burnt book. You know, you write the name of the person you don't like, and then you're just like, oh, they're so annoying. Look at her chewing her gum and whatever. Uh, so that's kind of like the stuff that I was, I started to write. But my English teacher was like, listen, how about if we kind of formulate and we use your writing for good instead of you like channeling in a negative way. And so she signed me up for a poetry competition. Um, it was like a Latino poetry competition. And so um, I ended up winning. I think I won $50 for the competition. And I was like, oh my God. I was broke back then, back then, right? Like, so 50 bucks for me was like hella. So I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. So people pay you money to kind of read poems and stuff. She's like, yeah, you can make a career out of it. And out of that is when we started, we started formulating a poetry group. And she took us to different schools around the area that were able, we were able to read our poems to. Um, and then eventually, as I grew older, it became a thing that just stuck with me. I think I really liked it. I was performing for large audiences and um, eventually I landed working um, on a project with Carlos Santana um, and he ended up funding my first book, which was for Color Boys Who Speak Softly. I don't really sell that book anymore because they're old poems that I'm just like, ooh. These are like my Taylor Swift poems because I was writing about, I was a teenager writing about I don't even know. And, <laughs> and so I don't really, um, that book was definitely launched me in my platform. And I wanted to have a book because I felt like I wanted people to take me seriously. I wanted people to know that I was really serious about my work. And I want people to know that it's not just a thing that this little immigrant kid is doing. It's something that I wanted to have an impact in the world. And thankfully, it, it caught the hands of like a bunch of professors and now they teach a couple of my poems at UC Santa Barbara and different schools. Um, I know I'm part of the curriculum. So it's very interesting to me because, you know, I only, I mean, I only have my BA. I'm thinking of going to get my MFA, which is my master's in, 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 in writing. Um, but I think for me, like the end goal for me would be to publish another book and possibly teach. I definitely want to, I see myself becoming like a community college professor or teaching um, literature and books because that's what I like. Um, let's see. Oh, what is the next slide? Okay. I was just going to, I think that I'll leave it at that and then we can um, open up for Q&A and then I'll, I'll end with uh, another piece from, um, from the formal show. Let me see if you have questions, answers, concerns, we can get into that. Um, and, or, and then I'll, I'll set up the, another read, um, what I'll read next, another excerpt that I'll read from my show. 
So if you guys have questions, please feel free to use the chat box. And then Tanya, the person with the questions, asked me. Um, she's going to be our chat moderator, so, so she'll read out questions. Okay, so the, one of the first questions, I guess someone did the math and they were asking, so are you 32 years old? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm about to be 32 in September. I'm a Virgo, September 22 is my birthday. Okay. The next question is, what was your favorite subject in school? I loved English English because that was the only good one I was good at. Math, if you're a math person, I was always in awe of people that love math because I was like, wow, you're super smart, but I could never do math. So I don't know. I made it to pre-calculus. Ask me anything about that. <laughs> but it was English. I was better at English. And then another question is, um, how do you define the difference between diversity, race, and culture? Uh, oh, that's a hard one. How do you do that? Diversity would be like a diverse population, right? Like the different people with different ethnic backgrounds, I guess. What was that second one? Diversity? Diversity, race, race and culture. Race would, well, it's in, race is interesting because if you define it by the census, on the sense, if you well, first of all, you all should submit the census for your parents. If you have not taken time to do the census, please do the census because we need to count you so we can get resources to your communities. That way, we have better schools and better programs to assist your families. Okay, that's my plug for the census. But in the census, if you notice, it's Latino, but then you have to check in white because according to whatever data, Latinos are considered white, which I don't know what that means. Um, so that one's a hard question. And then culture would be anything. Culture can be anything you create, anything a subgroup creates, right? So for example, there's queer culture, there is um, um, just like, the, you know, even in the music that you listen to, right? Hip hop culture. So I guess it would be like the, the, the subgroups that uh, a, group, a group of individuals create can be any culture. I'm like, I feel like I'm taking the SATs. I hope. <laughs> All right. So the next question is, how have you practiced resting in these times, finding joy slash peace? Let me tell you, they say that after, since I was just reading an article that if you work through Zoom, and I'm sure it's a lot of the students are taking classes or um, part of different things through virtual chats that your Zoom day has increased by 45 minutes um, because it's just like the, the thing that everybody is on overdrive and, and working. But I've been really good. I don't check my emails on the weekend. So I come back on Monday to a bunch of stuff, but I definitely don't check my emails on the weekends. Um, and I'm just reading. I run every day. Uh, I've been trying to run five miles a day, which is really good because it makes me, um, the runner's high kicks in and I start thinking of different projects. And then I think about it, I'm like, oh my God, five miles is a lot of miles to be running, but I'm practicing, I'm out here. Um, and then I, I listen to music, so when I'm running, I pretend like I'm in the club because, you know, how do I go out and I, I'm out here twerking for three hours and no se me acaba la respiración. And it so happens that you start working for 30 minutes and you're dying. So it's a mind trick. So if you want to work out and if you're out here trying to be more active, just play, put your like playlist and pretend that you're out dancing with your homegirls and trust and believe that you will get it done. Just a little tip. <laughs> Thank you. So we actually do have a lot of questions here. So um, the next question here is, are there other projects you're working towards at the moment regarding your work? Yeah, I just launched, uh, I, right now I become, I launched a writing series. So this month I'm conducting a five week long writing series for undocumented writers. Um, we commission, we, I have a cohort of 15 undocumented writers that are mentoring 
to kind of create bodies of work. So I'm excited about that. Um, I have to finish my show. So right now I'm drafting new stuff on my show and hopefully we're going to mount it so it becomes virtual so we can just like record it in a studio and be able to, to um, um, showcase it. So that's going to be exciting. Um, and then um, the third one that I'm working on is just like different, um, different smaller projects. I want to do more video, like the video that we just, ju just shot. Um, we want to figure out how to create more content um, to kind of represent our communities and stuff. So that's exciting. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, so how was it growing up? Was it hard? Was it stressful? Oh my God, it was so hard. Like, honestly, let me tell you, my life was so difficult. I think it's just because we didn't have access, right? I think right now it's very interesting that we, I was like, I did a live the other day talking about how I was, now that I'm back at my grandma's house, that I'm renovating the apartment because I was like, you know, when you're an immigrant and you're surviving, aesthetic is not like a, a thing. So I was joking about how we, La Rosa de Guadalupe needs to do an episode about Latino hoarding because it's a real kind of a thing in our families. Um, and I was like talking about my grandma and these ollas from Royal Prestige that are like 12 years old that she needs to get rid of, but she doesn't. So I was just talking about like, um, yeah, in our household, like I was like, grandma, you know that the pillow needs to complement the carpet so then the light can come in and then it gives you serenity because if the room looks airy, you can focus and you can meditate and then it smells nice. And, you know, as Latinos growing up in working class environments, we did not have that <laughs> kind of luxury. So I think for me growing up was definitely, my, my family now thinks, well, they always thought, they would be like, te crees mucho, te crees mucho, right? And I think it's their way of kind of saying like, we don't, we don't get you, we don't get where you're getting these ideas. Um, but now they're, they're kind of seeing that I'm trying to um, better our way of living. I think they're a little bit more welcoming. They're still resistful. Another day I had to throw my grandma's shoes away Girl, a tantrum. Estaba llorando de que cuando estaba en México ella no tenía zapatos. I'm like, girl, that, we're not there no more. You have 13 pairs of shoes that you don't use. We need to donate them to someone that's going to better use them. But now, yeah, it's been a whole, <laughs> I'm having my own Mary Kondo kind of moments with my family right now. <laughs> okay. Um, what was your first thoughts when you got to the United States? Um, <laughs> what were my first thoughts? I don't know. I think I, it was very different. It was hard because we didn't speak the language. I was young. I was really young. I was a kid. So I think for us, it was very interesting because it not, it's not like you get a brochure that tells you like, this is a Latina where you go, you know, you just have to figure it out on your own. And I think for my family it was definitely, that was very difficult. But I came here when I was three, but I did, by the time I was five or six, I already like absorbed the language. So you ya sabía navegar different things. So I was already translating and stuff. So I think for me, it was more like the translating part that was very hard, especially when you're a kid, because then your parents, I don't know. I don't know what kind of parents you have, but my parents didn't really care that I was six. Like they were out here like, ¿Por qué no sabes? And I'm like, girl, I'm six. Like, of course, I don't know. And I feel like till this day, I'm sure you still have parents. If you're like in school, they think that you know everything because you're in school. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give you wrong advice, but that's your fault because you're pressuring me to know something I don't know nothing about. <laughs> But now I, now I like it. Now I feel like that, you know, even now that I'm having a conversation about like, you know, be, being frustrated with this place, it's my home. It's where I, where I have all my friends. It's where I have all my family. So I, it would be different. I think it would be very difficult to start again from a place that I don't know. But I think for now, I think I'm enjoying this time and space with all my family and my friends. So, yeah. And then let me know when to stop on the questions. Um, the next question here is, how do you think your intersectionality and mixed family status affected your poems and advocacy? 
Um, I think it made me more trying. It made me more aware of trying to uh, to add more context and texture to las historias because we all have different upbringings, right? I think my grandma has her own anecdotes for lo que le pasó a ella aquí en los Estados Unidos. I have my own, and my other, my brother, and my sister, they all have their own. But I think for me, it was making sure that I am able to capture the whole thing. And and, um, and it's not just one thing. So I think for me, it, be, it made me more well-rounded in the conversations that I wanted to have. Um, so yeah. Let me see if I you can uh, you can ask me one more. Let me see if I can find the the piece that I wanted to. I wanted to talk about when I was sixteen because that was a uh, very diff challenging. I think when six when I was sixteen, it became really. Um, difficult because I started realizing that not everybody lived like this and then I was I just became really kind of frustrated because I was like oh my god I'm 16 all these kids in high school are doing all these things that I can't do because I don't have a social security number even though I'm smarter than most of them um, I can't do things I think that was my frustration um, do you have one more or do it should I just get into this this piece that I'm about to read. Yeah, go ahead and um, go into your piece. And thank you everyone to who submitted um, questions. We had a little bit more than 30 questions submitted. So thank you for that. Oh, you guys are cool. Okay, cute. Okay, is that, I just want a picture when I'm 16. I'm 16, I'm really excited. It's my 16th birthday, uh, September 23rd. And what does my grandma do? She makes me want to get a job because oh, she says that I'm 16. That was what I hated. Here we goes. It's my 16th birthday, and while all the kids at school are learning how to drive and brag about how their parents are buying them the first car, I can't help but think why God is testing me. Stephanie's mom bought her a new car for her six, sweet 16. Every morning, she would drive past me down Story Road, honking and waving as I'm sweaty and bullets running to school. You would think she would stop to give me a ride, but no, that would be too much for her. I would stop, but honestly, I gotta stop at Starbucks first, and you know the lines are always so long. Plus, I don't like being late to class. Besides, you look like you could use the exercise. Stephanie's the type of citizen I would pray to God got her citizenship revoked. Uh, my parents want to go to Mexico for winter break. You're so lucky your parents can't go anywhere. When Stephanie would tell me this, I would pray, pray please, Diosito, make someone steal her social. 16 is a defining year for undocumented people, or rite of passage of shorts. While the average American kid is worried about getting the driver's permit or finding the first summer job, most undocumented kids are getting their fake social for the first time. Abuela says that I'm turning 16, then maybe it's time for her to take me down to La Tropicana to get a green card. La Tropicana is a Latino supermarket on Story and King with its very own tortilla factory, so naturally it became a hub for all the Mexicans in San Jose. While most kids in this country have parents that take them to, to, to the DNB to they get driver's permits, mine are taking me to the parking lot of a supermercado to commit a federal crime. Since I'm 16, Abuela decides it's time for me to get a job. At 16, the only summer job I want is at Raging Waters or Great America. I'm trying to be that person selling corn dogs and tater tots and pressing buttons so the roller coaster can start. Those are the kind of jobs American kids should have. But no, of course not. That would be too much to ask. I will have found a job for me working at an electronic factory in Fremont. Alum Technologies, where my tia Ella works. They don't check for papers, so she has. She's the. She says no one will notice that I'm 16 and not 18, like it says in my fake ID. I look at my ID. In the picture, I look hella paisa. We took the picture of Fotografia Medina, and the señor in the picture told me not to smile. My mustache is growing out, and abuelas fucked up my hair, so I look older. Whoever made my ID didn't even bother to use an X-Acto knife to cut around the picture. My ID looks like whoever made it used training scissors and Elmer's glue to put it together. According to my abuela, this factory gets away with hiring undocumented workers because they're a staffing agency run by Chinos. I tell my abuela that the folks are Vietnamese, not Chinos. Hello, we're in San Jose, but you know Mexicans and their racism. Ugh, racist abuela. In essence, how this works is that these huge corporations employ these staffing agencies for them not to be liable for the workers, meaning if any of us get injured on the job, technically it's our fault since the corporation didn't directly hire us. 
It's five in the morning. Our ship at the factory starts at six. Since my tia Elo doesn't drive, we have to wait for La Raitera. La Raitera is an also everyday name for La Señora that's the only one with the license. Being that we're in California, didn't grant undocumented people a driver's license until 2003, 2013, this is how we got around. La Raitera was basically like Uber, another great idea that these tech guys stole from the undocumented communities. Her role is to give rides to and from the factory in Fremont. She charges $15 a week per person, and being that she manages to squeeze all eight of us inside her Honda Civic, well, you know this homegirl is making hella bank. We get to work. It's a huge factory, and the workers are mostly older senoras or one and two dudes. No one speaks English, and even though the line leader commences in broken English, in my head I correct her because I'm evil like that. Our job is anything but fun. We stand on our feet for eight hours, sometimes 12, depending if we're forced to work overtime. It's an assembly line, so we, we stand right in front of one another. But we can't, we're not allowed to talk, much less chew gums. We're like human robots, assemble, assembling computer products, unable to have any social interaction. I stare at my tia. In my head, I think, they should build robots for this, because this is, work is so mindless. My tia Elo is the fastest one in the line. She's proud to show it off. It's almost like a game, and slowly one after another, each senora joins the game. I am annoyed, dreaming of a life as corndog salesperson. They smile and race, and see, and we can see each other who can package the most products. We can't make noise, so the senoras throw in their laughter in their belly. They smile cheek to cheek. Their cachetes are blown like balloons, trying to hold back the laughter. Before we know it, our 14-hour shift has ended. We pile back into the Honda Civic. I'm the smallest one of all the senoras, so I have to lay on top of their laps. There is always mad traffic on the way from Fremont to San Jose. I'm dozing off, but the, ra but the radio is on blast. Tia Elo looks back at me mid-song. Her eyes are heavy. She smiles and says, mañana vamos a trabajar otra vez. I roll over, closing my eyes. Please, God, I hope they fire me tomorrow. <laughs> so that was my experience when I was 16. <laughs> So yeah, I think with this show, one of the things that I want to capture is like the different layers of experiences that I've kind of had as um, an immigrant. And I think these are stories are universal. You don't necessarily have to be undocumented to kind of relate to them. But I think we all have kind of different anecdotes that are make our lives more richer now that if you've learned to live with it and cope with it. And I think as a, a writer and my, my writing has helped me kind of meditate and able to accept the things that I've lived to now view it as a sitcom. And now I view it as a humorous. I'm like, oh my God, that was funny. I can't believe that happened to me. So hopefully, if anything from this, you're kind of seeing yourself reflected in some of these stories and kind of seeing that, you know, in a way you can also write um, your, from your lived experience and know that you are like, in a, you have an abundance of stories um, that make you interesting and make you unique and dynamic. I think one of the things that happens to us is que a veces in our families, we learn to see, you know, your family, cuando le preguntas a tu mamá or your parents, like the stories that they live, they'll just be like, ay, para que quieres saber eso, eso no importa, right? But it does matter. It, those stories do matter because they, they showcase how powerful and amazing you are. And I think one of the things that happens when we do in this country that we do is that we tell people like, oh, you need to be extraordinary. You need to be like amazing. But I think it's very important to remember that there's a lot of power in being ordinary. Being like everybody else, it's powerful because we relate to that, right? There's nothing special about me. There's nothing, you know, I'm an undocumented immigrant that grew up mad poor matando cucarachas, you know, and like that's, there's nothing special. It's like everybody else's life. But one of the things that makes me, uh, that, that makes me is that people are like, oh, I know that too, because I live that. I connect to that story. So I think that's the bond that we do have when we do share our stories and when we start writing about the things that we become embarrassed about. Que podemos encontrar other people that can relate to us and at the same time feel like, oh my God, I want to laugh about that too because I found that funny. So I try to do that within the work and in the show um, so people can laugh because it's fucking, it's ridiculous. I'm like, I can't believe that happened. But yeah. Thank you so much, Yosimad. We're really grateful to have you here as our keynote speaker for the Alianza Youth Summit. Um, I don't know if you have one final message of like, 
no sé, algo. Yeah. No, I think my final message is that, again, my final message is that there's power, there's a lot of power in being, if you never, if you grew up never feeling like special, never feeling like I can contribute to anything or like never feeling like I have, uh, I, I, I'm not that, I can't do that, right? I think really owning the stories that you come from and really owning those anecdotes and really owning las cosas que tu mamá, your papá, your family, your tías tell you, I think that's more than sufficient for you to, to make it. And I think one of the, um, I have imposter syndrome all the time, right? Because I haven't, pub I'm like, I haven't published a book. I haven't done a lot of things that I wanted to, I want to do. But I think one of the things for me is knowing that I come from a lineage of people that have kind of fought for my place to exist in this country and in this world. And because they've kind of done that work already, I don't have to justify anything anymore. Like I have to just stand in my power, stand in my voice um, and command it. So if anything, that's my message to you. Like your parents already made the sacrifices that I had to do for you to stand in your power and own your voice. So yeah, you don't have to justify anything for nobody. Just dare to use your voice and, and strength and that's it. Okay, uh, so Yosimar um, and everyone that is here, um, we, before Yosimar leaves, we wanted to get like a group picture with all of us, as many as we can. So if you wanna turn on your camera and be in this picture, please turn it on. And if you prefer not to be in the picture, um, you can just keep your camera off. So, Silvia is going to be taking this picture for us. And I don't know how we want to pose or what, but put on your best face. Because <laughs> this will be posted on Instagram. <laughs> Silvia, if you want to give us a countdown, please do. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I can unmute myself. So I'm gonna take two pictures just because we have two different um, pages of all of you. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick countdown because it is a, just a fun little screenshot, okay? So if everybody is ready, there's so many of you. <laughs> if everybody is ready, I'm gonna go uh, three, two, one. Cool. All right. Second one. Oh. Next. All right. Here's the second one. Three, two, one. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. And with that, you can use the reaction buttons to thank Yosimar again for being here, for sharing with us, for getting this summit started with all of us. Um, and then Yosimad, again, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate everything that you did um, and for sharing with us. So Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. God bless America. Have a wonderful um, <laughs> summit. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Yosimad. So uh, welcome all again. Thank you all for being here. Um, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to be going into community groups. We have like a five minute interval right now where I'm gonna be explaining what community groups are. Um, so as you know, you are here at the Alianza Youth Summit. It's our first virtual summit ever. And our theme for this year is Univex en la Lucha, where we will be talking about how to be sharing our story, how to be good allies, how to be resilient, the power that we have and so much more. And we've been preparing for the last three months to put the summit on for you all with input from youth, um, with our amazing fellows, and we're really excited to finally get started. So right now, lo que va a pasar is, you should all have gotten an email from someone or a phone call or text and uh, you should know what community group you are in based off of the number that's in front of your name. 
what's going to happen is our host, Mary Lombera, is going to put us into community groups. And in those community groups, uh, your lead, it will be either a fellow or a youth that has been helping us plan this all. And they will be kind of doing like the interaction that we can't do in person right now because of Corona. So um, in there, you'll be able to discuss, to unpack, to learn about other youth. And um, we're really excited because we, rec we recognize that this is the first time we can really be accessible at a greater capacity to people from all across Washington, right? Um, so yeah, I think Mehdi, if you have that all set, um, we'll start, stop recording as well. And then 